Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks to all of you for being here today. We appreciate your time. Um, I, I kind of had a question for everyone, and so we'll um, see how, how we go about it here. But it could be argued that one of the strengths of administrative litigation is the ability for the commission to consider novel legal theories and employ innovative forms of economic analysis, things that the DOJ may not be able to do. So how does the commission's use of innovative evidence and novel legal theories advance antitrust law, especially in today's complex and rapidly changing digital economy where they may not be precedents out there um, to rely on? And I guess I'll start with you, Ms. Garza, and we can go. Yeah. I don't think I understand the premise of the question. Um, in, in both the DOJ and the FTC follow the same merger guidelines that they have jointly developed and issued. Um, the notion, and it's not clear to me what innovative approaches um, anyone has in mind with respect to mergers, but to the extent that there are any, it's not clear to me why the DOJ would be less well placed to pursue them than, than the FTC. Part of part of the I think the question has been around having people who have expertise in a given area and understand, um, yeah, and are able to bring that expertise to the table, especially on a on a newer industry or newer type of technology. But then again, then what you're what you're suggesting is that you still have the role of the, of the court, of the FTC, and deciding whether or not there should be a preliminary injunction. Um, and so there's the issue of whether they should base, you know, have a lesser standard. Then it goes to an ALJ, a single ALJ, which is an employee of the FTC. The question is, why would the ALJ be in any better position to assess uh, a merger than, than any of our judges uh, that we have? I, there's this, the, I mean, Bert talks about the difference between a generalist court and a specialist court, but the problem is, I think what p people perceive is that what you're really setting up is a system uh, where you get a lower standard for a preliminary injunction, and then it goes to a judge who is an employee of the Federal Trade Commission, and then it goes to the commission that issued the complaint in the first place. And there, there is no, I'm not aware of any, any evidence suggests that somehow or other that ALJ is in any better position than would be a district court judge in the District of Columbia or any other district to consider the arguments and the evidence that the DOJ or the Federal Trade Commission would put forward as to why a transaction would be anti-competitive. Okay. Um, Mr. Four, you get your feedback on that? Um, I, th I think that uh, the the ALJ problem is a problem that you've, you've got to make sure you've got uh, top level, top quality ALJs. But an ALJ who deals with antitrust issues day in and day out over years is likely to be much more expert and much more able to contribute to the systematic development of the law than a whole bunch of federal district court judges, many of whom are not trained in economics at all and who, none of whom, get very much experience with these cases. Uh, very few federal district court judges deal with more than a few uh, merger cases, let's say, in, uh, in any given year or maybe in a lifetime on a court. So there is a big difference between attempting to develop in a systematic, predictable way uh, a pattern of law, and we're doing that largely through guidelines, jointly written guidelines, which is great, but we're not getting much assistance from the courts in, in developing this body of law. And there are probably two reasons for that. Uh, one I, I, I gave you, the lack of expertise, but these cases are very fact intensive, and it's hard to have appeals or to develop appellate uh, jurisprudence in these kinds of cases. In fact, uh, you know, we could have a guess about how long it's been since the Supreme Court took on a merger case. Uh, I don't know if any of us remember one <laughs> in our lifetimes. So uh, it's very useful, I think, to have a, a body of experts that can uh, handle this law. Thank you. Um, I wanted to also, um, Mr. Ford, you spoke a little bit, or I think in your testimony um, had talked about that any concern about the Smarter Act reaching transactions other than proposed um, Hart Scott Rodino mergers. And so I wondered what your thoughts were on that and whether think you think the bill would apply to other things like consummated transactions or non merger activity or, or move into that area. 
Well, I don't think it's going to apply outside of merger, joint venture, and whatever similar transactions might mean, although that in itself is an interesting question. Uh, it could uh, give rise to some litigation down the road of, of what's covered and what's, what's not covered. Uh, I, but I don't think that monopolization cases or cartel cases are, are going to be affected by this, nor would uh, non-consummated mergers. Uh, hopefully, that I did raise a question about nonprofits in that regard, but hopefully the, um, the this bill would be trans uh, interpreted so as not to create a problem that way. And uh, it, you know, it's intended to be narrow, and I think it largely achieves that goal. But uh, it's not not in, it's not bad in the sense that this bill will change areas outside of mergers. Okay. Thank you, thank you, and I yield back my time, or I'm out of time, thanks. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Bonnet.